All right, we're live here at our uh, 2024 draft extravaganza. Jeremy White in the house. WGR. Jeremy, it is a pleasure. Like I told you, I hear your beautiful angelic voice in the morning and to see in person. I'm honored because you have kids as well. And like I told you, to cash in those Marriott points with Go Long for our event here personally means quite a bit. It's not easy. No. It's not easy to cut away and get a day. But how in the hell are you? Good. I have two, and we have a third on the way. So, yeah, cashing in those points. Have I talked to you since uh, news? Maybe not. Maybe not. We have a third. It's breaking news. Yeah, July. Congrats. So, quick. So, cashing in those bright out points is about cashing them in now also because as of July, like, shut it down. <laughs> I know everybody wants to build draft takes, but, I mean, we got to know. Like, to go to that level, to go to three, um, was was that difficult for you? I mean, we're having that conversation now, and yeah. I'm quite sure where I, where I fall down on that. So, that conversation is kind of funny for anybody. I mean, maybe you've experienced this too, but, like, we talked about going to three, and then we found out, oh, you're in fact going to three. It was not planned. It was oh. very much a surprise. Okay. Oh, okay. Oh. okay. <laughs> so we're going to three. Um, I love it. But it's fun. Our, our kids are three, and our daughter especially is very excited about having a baby sister. We know it's girl. So um, all that is just like to watch my daughter be in love with the idea. And when I carry a baby around, I pretend to have a baby. Like it's uh, it's it's pretty great. It's pretty great. Nothing is better than being in town. I mean, it's you, there's so many moments. I know you're a Bluey family too, right? Yeah. What about that episode? It, Listen, there's talk that it's over now, and I'm just not okay with that. Or that it's trending towards a finish, and that's not going to be okay. I, I could give you 20 minutes of takes on Bluey because if you watch. Bluey will make you a better parent. Oh, yeah. It's a kid's show that makes you a better parent. And that's super valuable. I mean, basically, like the Tom Brady of Fox. Yes. Yeah. So he just has you know, yes. two kids on each arm while he's playing about three games at once yeah. and teaching a life lesson all at the same time. And there's like a couple of different things to take away from that. I saw Dale Earnhardt Jr., of all people, said that the Bluey dad gives an unrealistic expectation of how to be a father. And I guess you could come away with that. Or the alternative is you can literally make up any game in the world and your kids are going to like it, which is basically what I've taken from it. I'll just steal games from the show and they couldn't be happier. So... If it is ending, it's rough. I mean, he's basically the the opposite of the dad at Starbucks on his phone, scrolling away as he has two kids sitting there just dying and begging. Yeah. To, like, there, there's no more depressing sight than that. Yeah. Like, I saw that a couple of weeks ago. I wanted to go up to the guy and just back down across the face. Yeah. Worst in shopping cart, by the way. It can be tough. I know. Like People have to work. People have to do stuff. Like, it can be tough. So it is, That's true. That's true. Yeah. you got to separate work. It's tough as it is. It's not easy. No. But we're here to work because yes. we've got beer, right? Yes. I mean, uh, we're, we're working here. I've got a, a cucumber blessings. That's fatty beer and hamburger. What are you working? I'm working on a dancing gnome. Dancing gnome brewery. I've got a couple go-to breweries. You know, I come to a fatty, I look at what they've got. I've got a short list of three or four that they've got that. I'm going to grab it. Dancing gnome's on that list. And they definitely have a beer for everything. Pale ales, IPA, seasonal, stouts. So let me ask you this, Jeremy. It's a good place to start. If you had a beer that was called Wide Receiver Train, what kind of beer would it be? What kind of beer would it be? It would be, uh, yeah, right. Like, what did I say here? Big bodied, strong, but you could drink it fast and it would have stick them on this so you could hold on to it really well. No, um, it's a good question. But yeah, the wide receiver train. I'm probably guilty of, you, you probably know how this is. Anybody else out there knows how this is. Do you take your work home with you? And man, when it comes to wide receiver train, I walk around all day thinking about the bills again, right receiver. And it's probably not good, but I'll just be driving and thinking about Savior Word. I don't know if that's the right guy. And I'm thinking about, I don't want anybody to tell me trading up for a Dunze is not responsible. I want a Dunze. So it constantly occupies my thoughts. 
Some help. I think we have to maybe get a it's either, it's either unhealthy or it's one of those things where if you do something you love, you never work a day in your life. Sure. It's somewhere in that spectrum. Unhealthy or that. Well, you were on this early and you were 100% correct yeah. to load up. And I know we've talked about it a few times over the years. I don't want to say you've been probably as consistent as anybody in the market. Like you've got Josh Allen load up with weapons. Just try to win shootouts. Yeah. Like, like think through that lens as much as you can while you have this quarterback. Uh, but in terms of the wide receiver train, like is there is there one that you love? Is there is there a Jeremy White receiver? There, there, there are a couple. But yeah, like I have been on this train or driving this train for a while. Two playoff games ago, the Bills dressed Cole Beasley off the street and John Brown. And then last year, they got a drop from Diggs. Everyone remembers that. They got drops from Trent Sherfield. Like they're throwing balls to Trent Sherfield and street free agent Cole Beasley in playoff games. The last couple of years, I felt they weren't deep enough at receiver. Now I feel like they're almost nowhere. I mean, Shakir and Curtis Samuel are nice. It's almost like those are the depth behind the guys I really want. You know, different different jobs. Who do I love? I mean, Marvin Harrison Jr. Okay, can't have him. Roma Dunze. Okay, maybe can't have him. I love the gap. I love Xavier the gap. I, I was talking about this with um, forget who, but if you're looking at red flags or like the knock, every player's going to have a knock, right? We spend months looking at a player like, okay, what's wrong with him? What's the problem? One of the problems with a get is, well, he just figured it out. Okay, that's bad. You only get four years in college. And if you become good in your fourth year, all right, that's good. Go draft him. I don't know how often you would say about any other business, well, he just started to have a successful business. Like, oh, he has a business. Great. That's a good thing. Sorry it took so long. So I don't worry about Legat in that way at all. I wouldn't worry about one year production. And I think the Bills, think about Dawson Knox never caught a touchdown in college. They drafted him. Devin Singletary. They didn't throw him the ball. The Bills said, you can catch balls up. Over and over again, we see them take tools, guys, and throw them right in, whether that's right down to Terrell Bernard or whatever. So, I love the Leggett idea. I would do Leggett at 28. I probably wouldn't think you could get him to 60, but the reality is, it's kind of like when they drafted Josh Allen. I've got guys I like, but the most important thing is they get somebody. And whoever that is, even if I think it's a bad idea to get eighty Mitchell, get somebody because you've got to start swinging at us. Great take because I, I totally. I mean, Xavier look at yeah, he didn't have production for three years. Jim, Jim Nagy, who runs the senior goal, we were talking about. He brought him up. He said, this, this is a fit for the Bills. This is somebody that they. This is before the Diggs trade, but a big physical. Boundary receiver that is going to win a jump ball with Josh Allen. You know Josh Allen's going to give him a chance. Yep. He said we talked to people in the South Carolina program, and they, they said like they, they basically challenged him to get better behind the scenes and ramp it up, and he met the challenge. That just screams Buffalo Bills. Everything that Brandon Bean talks about, Sean McDermott. They they want somebody that is going to put the onus on them. Personally, do something about it. He, he took his game to a different level. Yeah, he looked like a completely different player. Yeah, and I think about you know comparisons can be tough because as soon as you compare a guy to a guy in the league, it, it almost kind of sets a bar that's hard to reach. But Brett Coleman, who does a lot of film breakdown studies videos, his comp for Leggett is AJ Brown. Like AJ Brown was a second round pick that I'm sure had a couple of things that were not perfect. But he's a big physical guy. He's explosive after the catch. So, to me, that's the other thing with the wide receiver train. I like Leggett as, oh, we'll have Diggs, Leggett, Shakir. And now, okay, uh, Leggett, Shakir, and I got to get somebody else over here. I don't know who that might be. They might have to draft a guy in the first and the third, and that could be fine. Brandon Ayuk? We'll talk about that, too, if you want. Um, there's a rumor going around town about Brandon Ayuk. Just, you know. Where's this rumor started? It's, you know how it goes. One of those telephone rumors. My friend told me this. My friend told me that. Let's see. 
But that's a good as idea as any. I, if you got the money to pay up for Brandon IU, do it. Yep. It's, it's good to have, you know, eight plus talents, eight talents at that position. Yeah, I want to, you mentioned um, Diggs. Uh, I would love to get your perspective. I mean, you're taking calls every month. You have a finger on the pulse of the fan base in a very anecdotal, non Twitter way, which I appreciate. I really truly feel. Like Twitter X magnifies the loudest, the angriest, smite over. Kind of lit, not too long ago. Sure, sure. Uh, so you're hearing some things. Now, wh- wh- what's the conversation around Stefan Diggs like before the trade and after? Because, look, I grew up in Ellicottville. I've been in this market a long time. You have as well. I've never seen, at least it seems on the outside, a fan base do a 180 like they've done with Stephon Diggs, where it's leave Diggs alone. He loves it here. He's going to be here a long time. He's one of the best receivers in the league to screw him. He's washed up, addition by subtraction. The flip is wild, but I don't I don't know if I'm reading too much into that Twitter world. You're talking about this thing in the morning. What's it really like in that side of and, and is it the shift been as hard as I think it is? I think the shift has been that hard. I think I think an important piece of con- an important piece of context here is Josh Allen is the king of this team. Period. And like I think back to the first, the first problem anybody had with Tiggs is what happened on the sideline in Cincinnati, against Cincinnati when he he's, he's doing something. We, we, we still do not know what he said. We have no idea the tone. All we know was it was some version of why does he describe it all along? Right, what he said. but then right that or you haven't watched Love Is Blind yet. <laughs> but we think it was some version of what are you doing out there? Throw me the ball. What's the matter with you? Something. And I just think it's always so interesting that. NFL teams and sports teams create a narrative around their team now. That's the new media. You know that. Every team, every decision, everything is perfect. Everybody gets along. Everybody loves each other. There's never any drama in this building. We're all in the same, we all pull in the same direction. And the people never clash. So that when you see a clash, it's jarring. Whoa. Whoa. You can't call out my quarterback like that. When in reality, of course you can. It happens in the locker room. It happens in meetings. It happens in off-seasons where there be clashes between friends or brothers. It was reported that by Tim Graham that last year, week one, Allen snapped at Diggs. Right. Wasn't on camera. Is anybody mad about that? Have you heard a word about that? I don't know what Allen said, but I would think Allen's like within his rights. Go ahead, snap at him. Go back and forth. You guys are supposed to be ultra competitors that are driving each other to greatness. Okay. Travis Kelsey choke Andy Reid at the Super Bowl or whatever. Like he hit him, you know? So I have a problem with getting hung up on that uber competitive stuff because that literally drives the sport. Yes. And so many people are so used to the videos of the high fives and everything's perfect. And then I think we've lost a little bit of that perspective. Like, of course they freak out. Pete Manning and Jeff Saturday screaming in each other's faces. Yes. It's an amazing video. Dan Fouts and Keller Winslow. Yes. That's another great one. Yes. Like, anybody does it. There's a Premier League game on in here, and that's very normal. If you, you know, you're playing soccer in the Premier League and you make a wrong pass when a guy looked, thought he had a shot, he's going to raise his arms and be like, what were you doing? And over there, it's just like, yeah, that happens. It's fine. Here, not just Buffalo, but here in the NFL, everybody actually has such a problem. And I just don't think it's a problem. So that's a long answer to your question of, yes, people did turn on him quickly because Josh Allen is the king. And as long as Allen stays, they could pretty much do anything they want. Anything in the world. They could, they could trade, you name it, Milano. If Allen said, if Allen and Milano got in a dust up on the sideline and they traded to Milano the next day, like, fine. You're like, I just think Allen is the king, and as long as he's here, there's going to be a belief that they'll always have a chance. 
And that's probably right. Before, like, yeah, that's such a great point because I, I was, after the dig stuff went down, I had to look it up here now. On my phone, former Bills assistant reached out to me and he said, Fans in Twitter have no idea how the real NFL works. And then the second text, no clue. And that's it, right? I mean, through the season, we see clips put out maybe by the team, by fans, things photoshopped, a certain message is condensed and pushed and it feels like everything was hunky dory. That's and that was the case for Diggs. Like you would see a fourteen second clip at a practice put together. I mean this is even a fan. It could be somebody in T V. Of Diggs like shaking his ass and they put a new put a new to it and and they're making fun of Stephen A. Smith yep. for even suggesting that something could be wrong in Buffalo with Stephon. There's a real NFL that is not Twitter. And that real NFL it might have Included, as you said, maybe there's a beef there with the quarterback, which, guess what, Josh Allen is going to win that. I've been told Stephon Diggs was done with Sean McDermott, and that's not taking sides. Like Maybe Sean McDermott is well within his right to be fed up with Stephon Diggs. Maybe there's something so bad behind the scenes that we don't know that yeah, removes the poison from the locker room. Maybe Stephon Diggs is what Stephon Diggs has kind of always been. You know, he arrived with some baggage. You knew that when you traded for him. And maybe the Bills should have gone out of their way to somehow develop that relationship. If Herm Edwards said he went and told he done, she like, pick three, four guys in that roster as a head coach, build that relationship, care about that relationship, make sure that that's good. Maybe the onus is on the Bills. So I'm somewhere in the middle. Like, I, I think it got to this point for a reason, and it's a shame. Because I don't think he's done. You know, through half of the season, he was on pace for a career year. The offense changed. They, they go to more of a power rushing attack and let Josh run, which is great. But Diggs kind of becomes, uh, I think I wrote in that column, he was basically DJ Collin. He's, he's kind of useless. You know? and it's, yep. and it's too bad it got to that point. But it got to that point for a reason, yeah. and it's, it's too and, it shouldn't. Right, and, you know, maybe he's ultra-competitive to a fault where it becomes unproductive. Okay, you know, you get a, uh, a span of time where it works, and then it wears out. Like, my favorite example to use on this is the Steelers, because Steelers are an organization that's so proud and they didn't have time for Antonio Brown. They don't have time for Le'Veon Bell. We're the Steelers. We don't deal with that stuff. That could never happen here. I'm the Steelers spent since Antonio Brown left. Just like the most middle of the road. Just I mean they're finishing nine and eight and making the playoffs. But I think about it in a lot of ways. Like, if you had a band that got together and made five platinum albums and then broke up, the band wasn't bad. It ran its course, and they're like, okay, hey, we're going to go all do our own project. So I guess the takeaway for me is, like, Ayuk is a good example here. The idea of trading for Ayuk, somebody on Twitter wrote to me, I don't want another diva. The answer is, you definitely should want one. You definitely should. You should want one for like four years, and then if it flames out, fine. But if you think that you're just going to, you know, get a bunch of high school coach sons, perfect citizens, you might, but some divas or some mercurial characters are going to be required for genius. Like, and what Dix does on the field is genius in a way. So, all right, he's a little bit out there. Handle it. Houston thinks they can handle it. And I'm, in, it and I'm inclined to think that they're probably right. They'll handle it. Maybe they'll win a bunch. Maybe he'll go in there and push Nico Collins to be a little better. Push Tank Dell to be better. I mean, Deion Dawkins, one year into the Diggs relationship with the Bills, wrote an article about how he showed all of them how good football players can be. It's Deion Dawkins. He's no slouch. And he said that everybody in that locker room understood on a different level how good you can be at football. So it broke up. It ended. That's okay. That's going to happen. It should not in any way scare you off of the idea. I'm trying to find it here as we're talking, but like Chad Hall, to that effect, said the same exact thing. It's 2020. Right before that AFC Championship game. 
cites Fontix as the maniacal competitor who helps raise everybody's ability. Yeah, he's somebody that's got a bunch of screws in the wires are a little cross that, by the way, made, made one of the most memorable plays in NFL history yeah. in the divisional round of the playoffs to get his team to the conference championship. I mean, there's a competitiveness to Savon Diggs that's, that is rare. And you want that. So if the direction is, for Bill's sake, you hope the direction isn't you just said uh, high school football, like militaristic, um, everybody get in line, do the same thing. And everybody's not going to be treated the same. It's a fine line, right? Because I, I part of me gets the Bills, they're going younger, no Mitch Morris, no Tredavious White, no Jordan Boyer. You're having these younger leader, leaders emerge, Terrell Bernard, Christian Benford. Like, may, maybe in their heads, it's, do we want a malignant presence setting a bad example? So if there is something we don't know, I'm open to knowing what that something is. It takes. Everything that we do know, you, you, you need a stud receivers to win in the NFL, and those stud receivers are going to come with Something extra that really you have to deal with. And they also, they, you know, people talk about that position as being the position of the diva. They're the only position, pretty much, where they can bust their ass all year long, do what it takes. And to the end of the game, they had one catch for seven yards. It's like, wow, you didn't show up today. It's like, actually, I did. I kicked that dude's ass across the line for the whole day, but I didn't get the ball. And you're telling me I didn't do my job? So, and that's that, that's where the that's why they're doing this, right? Like, it's tough. I think they're. they're it's, it's, I hate that word. Right. I think they're put in a, in, a, in a tough situation. But like again, getting back to the current Bills, and I think the Bills deserve credit for this because one of the things I remember is Diggs on the Von Miller podcast were talking about being here when he was happy was. They let you be yourself. Like they've got different personalities. They're not some Tom Coughlin ship. I don't think. I don't think. You know, they're going to bring in different characters, and different kind of guys. Like Isaiah McKenzie. You know, like he, he annoyed them, but they loved him. But and like, <laughs> and it, in a way, like like they're going to let you be you because that's important to have different kind of personalities. Yes. I mean, we were just talking about it a little bit. The, the aftermath of our uh, three-parter here is is really interesting. But, like, that was something that very few people picked up on. I mean, Isaiah said it. Taiwan Jones said it. I thought Taiwan made a great point. Where he, he was with Buffalo originally, early in Sean McDermott's tenure. He was unhappy. He did not like living in Buffalo. He thought it was way too militaristic, way too... Like, you can't be yourself, you can't have certain beliefs, you can speak those beliefs out loud. He leaves, he goes to Houston, he catches the pass from Deshaun Watson in the wild card game, that ends the season, gets him in field goal range, he comes back, and he, and he says, that guy's going to be sucks. He could talk to Sean in the cafeteria. Isaiah McKenzie said the same thing. I, I, I think that's true. And Deion Dawkins has said it. And that's important, which makes this whole Diggs storyline riveting. Like, there's a lot that we still don't know, yeah. and I guess we probably should move this forward a little bit. But uh, you do have to draft a receiver, yes. And there's going to be some red flags, whether it's Leggett with one year production, AD Mitchell with being a diabetic and not knowing which AD Mitchell you're going to get if he's not being disciplined with his head, his Bob again road. Or I tell you what, the guy I love, Jeremy Xavier Worthy. I mean, you have lived in fear of a Tyree kill. Yes. He's, that, that's a huge reason in 13 seconds. You had your DBs lined up 30 yards off the ball. You're, you're terrified. You're thinking overtime is a good thing. That's what one coach said. Like, it's, let's just get there. You're worried that he's going to get to the house. Why not try to find your own run? I, I feel like that it has to be in the minds of being in the tournament. Like, this is... This is a weapon who can bring that effect and just stress the field in ways nobody on the offense has. Yeah. And to that point, like, it's worthy if it's any one of these receivers. I think that a, a sleeping storyline is the pressure on Joe Brady. Joe Brady came in, and the offense did not get that much better. Defense got a lot better. The most points they gave up once Brady took over. Philly, they lost. But in the games they won, most they gave up, I think it was 22. 
So the defense rounds in the form. All of a sudden, they start winning games. They beat the Patriots in a not a blowout. They beat the Dolphins in part because of a punt return touchdown. They beat the Easton Stick Chargers by two. I think it's been a little bit overblown how good Joe Brady did. And that's why, back in the Diggs conversation, like, oh, well, Diggs wasn't really a part of the offense in those eight games, I think. Why, did, why have people decided to line up on the offensive coordinator that was an interim coordinator that came in and not the quarterback and wide receiver that have passed for the most completions, yards, and touchdowns in the entire NFL in the time span they've been together? I've got lots of resume here and a coordinator that seemed like he did an okay job. So, I'm saying Brady's a bum. we see what he does with their offense. But that's going to come quick. It's early in this season, one, two, three, four weeks in. They look like a running team that isn't explosive on offense. I think those questions are going to come from Brady quick. That is a, a fresh take. And I pre- it's, you know, it's easy to forget that game in LA. I mean, they easily could have lost that. Just didn't stick. Bailey Zappi and the Patriots, right, in, in your house. Yep. If, if Rasul Douglas and give Brandon B. credit for trading. Yep. Was Joe Douglas. They're going to need him this year. Starting outside. Without him, I mean, did they lose to Bailey Zappa? Offensively, something was still kind of uh, And you, you know, I, I get it. The Chiefs won the Super Bowl, and it was a different Chiefs offense. They nickeled and dimed, and they adjusted, but you still need to be exposed. You look at this conference. You've got Mahomes, Lamar Jackson, CJ Stroud, Joe Burrow, um, Whatever you see in Miami, I mean, they're going to put up a lot of yards and some points here in the regular season. You're, you're going to need big plays. That's why I love Worthy. What, what happens if they take a cornerback or a D lineman? Well, they did, What's okay. your show like that next morning? It's a good question. There are some okay. defensive linemen I would be excited to get. Like, if they were to get the UCLA defensive end, if he somehow fell in the 28, he won. His medical is why, like, people thought he would fall. I bet he goes to the teams. But they're to nab him or even Chop Robinson. Friday morning sounds like, okay, everybody, wait. Just wait till tonight. As long as they get it right tonight, we'll be okay. If they don't get it right tonight, we're in trouble. Because Curtis Samuel can't be your number one receiver on the outside. You can't roll Curtis Samuel and Mac Collins into this year and think you're going to be okay. Three base is good. There. I mean, they, they needed a receiver badly in Rodgers' last season. They took, I believe, Quay Walker and Devontae Wyatt on defense first round instead of maybe trying to trade up and get a receiver. Packer fans listening, they remember this well. Like, Losing their minds, and then what happens? They get Christian Watson, they get Romeo Dobbs, then the next year they get um, Jaden Wicks, Wicks. Jaden Reed. Jaden Reed. They've just been drafting receivers, and that's because these aren't first round picks. So, right. you know, they, they can go defense, but then take two or three receivers. And that's a key difference between the Bills and the Chiefs. People like to point out, like, well, the Chiefs won the Super Bowl, and who are their receivers? That's not, to me, that's like the wrong takeaway. The Chiefs have been drafting them. So the team that won the Super Bowl without them has still shown you they think they're really important. Sky Moore, Rashid Rice, they trade for Kadarius Tony. They, they signed Juju Smith Schuster. They signed MVS to three for 33. That's a team that has tried to find their next receiver. And they probably will this year again. So if you take away on much of the Chiefs from the Super Bowls, oh, why do I need a receiver? you got to look at the Chiefs and say, they think they need one, and they're winning without it. So what happens when they actually get a game? What happens when they get at dimension or Xavier Worthy? And all of a sudden it's, you know, the Mahomes with, I don't know that Xavier Worthy's next time to kill, but the point about the speed there is, oh, the fastest receiver in the league now plays for Patrick Mahomes. Again, uh-oh, they're going for it again. Their takeaway wasn't, we don't need a receiver. It's, uh, and Tyree Kill's name wasn't quote. I gotta find the exact quote from a scout, but he, he does have that ability to see. And so, in, in Bob's uh, series, he was ranked ahead of Brian Thomas at number four. Worthy? Worthy. 
Um, this is a scout to uh, Bob McGinn. Immediately, you have so much hidden production because every single defensive coordinator in the NFL is scared of one thing, a guy getting behind the defense. If Worthy's on the field, you're backing the fuck up because it's a Tyreek Hill fest opening up the middle of the field all day long. He's a true Z that can run by anybody in the NFL. I put him behind Waddle coming out, but ahead of Marquise Brown. And that's the other thing. Like He's going to help McKay. He's going to help the little Shakira, Curtis Samuel. He's underneath kind of weapons. I mean, that, that's a hidden production. Like you're, you're terrified of this guy going deep. Like the Bills were at Arrowhead in 13 seconds. And think about the evolution of the NFL. It's always evolving. If you had Xavier Worthy eight years ago, you might think a certain thing about him. Now, now that every team in the league runs that cheat motion that the Dolphins just invented, they go, we'll just run cheat motion with Xavier Worthy. Oh, okay. He's getting three releases against these corners. You watch Tyreek Hill. The guys are like, oh, so I, I got him. Because he gets that free release. So, I mean, what if Miami gets Xavier Worthy? <laughs> of course they'll try, right? Like they have an identity. They know what they want. They want to be attracting an offense, and you know they haven't beaten anybody any good yet. I think they ultimately will in time. I think their coach is brilliant. I think they're set there for a long time. And you know, like I would be worried about Miami in the arms race. Who starts ahead of you? It's easy. It's an easy team to dismiss because they own them, but. They're still there. But how many years How many years in a row of Tua passing for more yards than Josh Allen would it take for a Bills fan to be like, no, it doesn't feel like it should happen. Tua won the passing title. And, that, and that's a, a team that runs through its offensive-minded coach. Let's just put it out there. Whoever drafts Xavier Worthy is going to win the AFC. So, uh, it's in there. It's, it, it's on the road. What's your take? It's on right. the take, right? Now. My take is this. Just get weird and get Roma Dunze. Let's go. Don't mess around. Go get Roma Dunze. You can't get high enough for Marvin Harrison. Get Roma Dunze. Don't do the picks. Don't mess around. Why do you need a first round? Get a first round. Why not? Bean said two things that I think lend that to being possible. Here's the trail of breadcrumbs and how the Bills are going to get a Dunze. One. The Bears are at nine. They only have four picks in the entire draft. Two, Bean said he would not rule out trading a future first. Doesn't love it, but if it's right, we'll do it. Three, he talked about future picks and said, if I'm dealing with a perennial playoff team, then I'm going to bump that down a round. You're a perennial playoff team, you know? So... What are you worried about trading? Twenty seventh overall pick, and on top of that, next year just say when you don't have a first. Yeah, we only had like fourteen first rounders this year, anyway. Teams love saying that. Just say we only had fourteen first round grades, so we're kind of happy we don't have a first round pick. Just say it. Nobody checks you. We're not audits. Just do it. Oh man, I'd be so good at this. It's so you funny know? you say that because when I did that Giants thing a few years ago talking to a lot of those scouts that have left. There's one former giant scout that said, yeah, uh, it was Chris Pettit who was still there. He said, I wouldn't be surprised if he changed his grade out of play. You know, I would love to, to do an audit. Everybody else is getting audited in the world. Like, yeah. Let's do an audit on some of these teams and how they view these prospects. You know, and, it, and I think Jim Marley's over there, my podcast uh, co-host, you know, he would say the same thing. Like, it wasn't necessarily trading a first-round pick for Sammy Watkins that, that doomed them. It was, by doing that, you're doubling down on E.J. Manning. Right. You've got Josh Hamilton. Yeah, double down on Josh Hamilton. Double down on Josh Hamilton. Do it. But, and, because that next year, 2015, you didn't really miss out on anything in that draft. Go back and look at it. You got Darby in the second round. It, it was, he's been better than most of these guys in the first round. So, and I think there's a key, like... People like to say the draft's a crap shoot. It's not a crap shoot. There's randomness in it. Some of it's random. But if you were to offer up, would you rather, would you trade the Bills for a strong pick for every pick in the sixth round? I wouldn't. Do you need 32 sixth round picks? How many players make your roster? Five? So there's diminishing returns there. Who loves to say, don't trade up, don't trade up. It's not smart. It's not smart. 
But those are people that are only looking at the draft from what did you pull from it? And the Rams are a great example of this. Rams haven't had a first round pick since Jared Goff. They have a Super Bowl, another Super Bowl appearance, and multiple NFC Championship games. Like you don't need that first round pick for the Bills. I'm ready to have it happen, happen. I'm ready to have some people tell me it's not smart, and I'm ready for those to hang a banner and go up there snarkily and say, "But too bad we don't have first round pick." Like, yes. who cares? Yes, who cares? I know it's not smart. I know it's not smart. I just don't care. It's a different. It's a different day. Eh? Are you in a sports college by chance? I used to. Be. So me and my brother have gotten back into it. We mentioned uh, my wife's Uncle Lou on the last podcast with Joey Mal- Molinaro. He, he's really into it. But it, it reminds me of like how you hunt for sports cards today. Like Everybody wants Victor Weminyama, a Brandon Miller. So I would take one Wemby Silver Prism over 30 Leaky Black you know, right. prism. Like, these, these cards you get one dollar for on eBay. Give me the win. Right. Try, try to go for it a little bit. Right. Like, should should the Vikings trade Justin Jefferson for thirty seven Carolina Panthers? Yeah. No. Just keep the best player. You know, you'll find other guys. You'll be fine. So, always aim for the best player. That kind of gets back to the Diggs thing. Like one thing I'm consistent about, whoever they are, I'll defend the great players no matter what, all the time. You know, I don't want to be sold on some guy that like good because you like him because he's nice. Like this is pro sports. We get the best dudes, win it, hang a banner. There's something we've never done around here. We don't hang banners for draft values added EPA. No one gets banners for that. If you get a dumb Zany plays for you and you retire his number, like the Julio Jones trade, win. Who they trade with? What did they get? Does anybody remember? Nobody cares. By the way, he, he checks every box personality wise too. He should have had a Super Bowl. Still mad about it. I mean, I mean, I done it. Like, I mean, he he, he checked. Yeah, I done it. The Bills are gonna love him. Raised on a farm. Boom. Lock it in. Here's a question: Would any Bills prospect be willing to lie and say they wrestle? Oh man! It might be. I mean, yeah, you can't do what Joe Mixon did and not recognize Sean McDermott. I, I remember you yes. telling me that. I can't do that. <laughs> yes, yeah, so you got to know who your head coach is if you yep. want to get drafted. Yeah. But yes, that that would be the uh, the other end of the spectrum. Just say you wrestled. Oh yeah, love wrestling. Right. Maybe, maybe if it wasn't on record at your high school, maybe you wrestled with your dad in the basement. Sure, right? Are there McDermott YouTube videos from when he wrestled? Like I went back and I watched some of your stuff. Got to say that one match. They'd be like. On the board. Put him up there. We love this kid. He did his research. Right? That's beautiful. Jeremy, this was a delight. Well, thank thank you. you so much, man. Thanks, Thanks for having me. I think I said, you know, let's just talk 15 minutes as we rotate through. I want to talk to you for another Anytime. All right. I'm around. Let's sign it off. Right. Not, Everybody, my kids are here. Time. They're here? They're here. They walked oh, in. My kids are here. My kids are here. I didn't even know. I don't know my wife took them, but... They're here. They must have gone in the back. All right. Well, we should uh, go mint it. Yes. All right. Let's get back to the extravaganza. Back at the extravaganza here at Fatty Beer. Jay Skursky, Buffalo News. Great to see you, Jay. Mike, how you doing? We, uh, I didn't okay. actually think you hit record it. here. Okay. Oh, there it is. Get my goal on, buddy. Beautiful. I, I just wanted to bullshit with you for hours on end. I know. I'm, I'm surprised we actually got around to this podcast, you know, drinking beers, catching up on life, football, but it's great to see you. What a what a good time here. Uh, Matt Fairburn, Chris Baker, Pat Moran. Veritable who's who. What a crew. What Jim a crew. Who's here as well? Mr. Monus. Mr. Monus. In the house. Oh, he refused the pot. He did. Yeah, he yeah, shot he, us right down. He said, you know what? <laughs> Screw you guys. I'm getting the hell out I'm of out here. here. Yeah. I'm out. That's all right. So we'll just bash Jim here for an hour or so. And <laughs> That's right. We'll go that route. But no, Jay does amazing work at the Buffalo News. Um, gosh, not, not just the stories you write, but at the press conferences, asking the questions that must be asked. I think that is a, that is a skill that you have, Jay. So... Great to have you, man. We had a fun uh, press conference this other, just the other day, right? First time we've heard from Stefan, or since the Stefan Diggs trade, Josh Allen, uh, Sean McDermott. I think there was a lot to be sort of diced out there about just what how that whole thing went down, the reaction amongst, uh, you know, the most impactful player on the team, the head coach of the team. Uh, but, yeah, I appreciate that. And, uh, yeah, that 
that trade, I think, has really been, you know, it, it was one of the most meaningful moves of the offseason, not just for the Bills, but probably NFL-wide. You know, especially the timing of it was pretty surprising and all of that. So I think there was a lot to sort of parse out in terms of what exactly happened, you know? So I, Jeremy White, we didn't mention him. He's here as well. We, we talked about the Diggs trade and where the Bills go from here as well. Um, but what was your takeaway from that press conference? Like, how do you think Sean McDermott, Brandon Bean, Josh Allen kind of handled all of that? And did you come away with an understanding of what the hell went down? Or did you come away with, well, that was a word salad upon a word salad of dancing around the issue or is it somewhere in between? I think it's somewhere in between. I, the, the takeaway, not necessarily from the, the press conferences, but just – in general, is they want it out of the Stefan Diggs business. There's no other way that you can look at this trade. One of the things that, and I tweeted this, but one of the things that Sean McDermott said that really stood out to me was, we did what was best for the Buffalo Bills in the near term and the long term. Well, okay, if you define the near term as the upcoming season, which I, which is what I would do, what did the Bills get back for that trade? A 2025 second round pick that isn't going to help them on the field for 18 months, right? and they lost cap space. So if it's helping you in the near term, it's because it's addition by subtraction, because you needed that guy out of your locker room. That's the only conclusion that you can draw from it helping you in the long term, because Brandon Bean said after the trade was made, yeah, we're probably not a better team right now. Well, if Sean McDermott believes that they could be a better team, it's because Stefan they, they had reached their limit with stuff on Diggs. And so that that's what I take away from it. I mean, you you mentioned Alan Diggs, or excuse me, Alan McDermott and B. Those are the three most impactful people in the organization, by far. None of them have cried about this. Publicly, they've all said, okay, yeah, we'll, it happens, we're moving on, right? They've all been, like, they've all recognized, like, yes, he's very talented, but we're looking forward. Yeah, And, like, if they're so willing to do that, it tells you that, like, I don't know if I would say that this is a long time coming, but there is a, a reason that Josh Allen was not – he was not up there, like, looking downcast. He was not looking at the ground. He was not – there was no anger. There was no resignation. There was – he was a really good player, and I'm really excited about what we have. To me, it, it screams of we we had to move on from this guy. We absolutely had to for whatever reason, you know, whether it's peace in the locker room, whatever it may be. But they're not better in the near term unless you believe that he was so hard to deal with that not having him around is better. Man, with, so we, with Jeremy, I mean, that's what we were kind of discussing is like this is a – and an A level talent. So, I mean, even even that first half of the season, he was en route to a career year. The offense changed. You can make the argument either way. Like they won without him. You don't need him. You can make the argument. Look at this AFC. Look at the firepower. Look at the quarterbacks. Look at the offense. If you've got a receiver like this, you need that receiver to put up points. Same time, I think you kind of answer that. Like some, there's something we don't know, right? Like. It, it, it must have been so bad behind the scenes. Like what what could that possibly be? It, it, there, there is a disconnect there. And it's and it has existed since the Bengals playoff loss, right? You know, you you see the demonstrative digs on the sideline screaming at Allen. And I don't think that things ever got better. He's missing the first day of mandatory minicamp. His head coach is saying that it is that he's very concerned that he's missed the first day of mandatory minicamp. There's never been any satisfactory explanation about why he wasn't there, about what that disconnect was. And so I don't know that it ever improved. I don't know that it ever got better. There was this lingering sense of, is he or is he not happy? And my question to Sean McDermott was, did that start to weigh on the organization? Were you just not able to deal anymore with the idea that you've got this dynamic player. It's dynamic on the field. There's no question. But 
Why do you have to keep answering questions? Why does he have to? Why does Josh Allen have to? Why does Sean McDermott have to keep answering questions about, is he happy? Is, does he want the ball more? Does he want more money? Does he want this? Does he want that? It, for whatever reason, and a lot of it had to do with Diggs, you know, cryptic tweets and all of this. Was it the final straw? I mean, was that it? You think the, the you sure that the shot of Josh Allen? The, the day before it happened. Yeah, I think it could have been because if you if you want to believe that Brandon Bean that the deal went down pretty quickly, I think they maybe looked at that and said enough is enough. We just don't want to deal with it. But it's nuanced, right? There are a lot of different reasons. It doesn't have to be one thing. Diggs wanted out. He wanted out. It, so so Diggs wants out. The Bills look at it and say you're 30 years old. You're turning 31. Over the last eight ten games of the year, Khalil Shakir was a better wide receiver. He produced more. Khalil Shakir makes one twenty seventh of what you make on the salary cap. We are looking at this, not just in 2024 cap dollars, but in 2025, right? He's free and clear. You can't tell me that a team is going to eat the largest dead money cap hit of any player in NFL history that isn't a quarterback, unless he is a massive migraine headache. And they just wanted out of the Stefan Diggs, Stephon Diggs business. That's the best way that I can say it. Every every clue has to lead you to that conclusion. I do think too, like because the Bills could have said they could have called his bluff. You know, I'm sure Stephon Diggs made it clear to the Bills, he's done, he's out, move me. The Bills could have called his bluff if they really wanted to it, wanted to yeah. hit hardball, get to the regular season, get and and, and dare Stefan to miss out What's on millions do? of dollars but sit out but could, right. could he have been a malcontent right you, you you let a lot of veterans go you have a younger team you want you new leaders to emerge i get that argument too but okay enough digs well he was he was team captain and you wonder yeah. i wonder his influence on his other teammates his younger teammates do they want him around that around that situation i I have good reason to believe that they probably do not want him around that right and what's 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 rubbing off on some of his teammates? I think that's a legitimate question. Another legitimate question, though, is can you win offensively the way that they they won late last season? Like, can you win running the ball? Can you win spreading out to multiple weapons? This is such a huge draft. I mean, if Brandon Bean and Sean McDermott go in and draft two, three wide receivers, maybe they trade up for a Dunze. Who, know, who knows what they do? I mean, this is really important. But I think the style of offense that this team plays is so crucial. So I don't I don't think that you're going to be able to, to – it's it's extreme to say that they grounded and pounded. We covered those Rex Ryan teams. Yeah. It's not that. No, no. But you've got – Joshua, you've got the strongest arm in the NFL. You need to let him run 10 times a game, and you need to let him throw it all over the field. And win that backyard style of football. You know, you could see that Diggs was getting frustrated toward the end of the season. And I remember reading at the time, like, it, this is such a, a juncture for the Bills. Like, you're going to have to spread it out. You're going to have to be more explosive to win playoff games. Um, saying that, even as the Chiefs won the way they won, they've got Patrick Ball. So it's, it's a different story. I, don't, I feel like you've got to you've got to find explosive playmakers in this draft. Do you, do you think that they they see it that way, or do you think that they see it as no, we can kind of win running the ball as much as we did? Hmm. That's a good question. I think that they see. I think it's a a mix of those two, right? I think that they want to be able to run it when they need to. I think they showed that last year against Dallas, right? They can do it. You know, like Took is a really good running back. I think they like their line play. You know, you said Patrick Mahomes and it's different. And my question is how different is it? I mean, Allen is, he's up there, right? He's not Mahomes, but he's ultra talented. I mean, the guy we talked before we started recording here, about how good he was in that Philadelphia game, the game that they lost, right? I mean, the guy was just stupid good. I mean, he's so, so good. And so do I think that they could – but I, I wonder if they look at Kansas City and they said, we traded Tyreek Hill and have won both Super Bowls since we did that. And now they have Travis Kelsey. And they rebuilt their whole defense yeah. in a way Buffalo has not, right? Like They well, drafted really well. Yeah, they drafted well, and they've gotten younger and – 
they've had rookie contributors. Sean McDermott hasn't played a lot of rookies. I think that's going to have to change. I think he's going to get a younger here on defense. But I, it's not about defense for me. It's about outscoring the opposition. You had 27 to 24, you lose to the Chiefs, and you're in position, right? And if Allen makes the right read and throws it to Diggs, and they get the first down in that game, maybe they win that game. Or maybe they pull ahead, and who knows what happens. They played the Chiefs as close as any team in the league, better than any team in the league over the last two or three years. They've beaten them in Arrowhead Stadium. They're right there. They can make the case that they're right there. I don't think that getting younger has to make them worse, necessarily. I don't think that losing stuff on digs means that they have to be less dynamic and less explosive on offense because I believe in Josh Allen that much. Your question was, do they have to get – that explosive player in the draft. I mean, certainly wide receivers indeed. There's no question. But I do think, and you, you know, you can you can offer some insight here. I mean, you you follow the Packers so closely, right? There's that idea of do they trade up for a doing something? That's that's the big swing, right? Do they maybe take the reverse and say we're going to go second round and fifth round at wide receiver, right? Because that's kind of what Green Bay did, right? And I think the fifth rounder ended up being better than the second. And so there's different avenues. I look at Joe Brady's history with Carolina. The year that he was, the full year that he was there, they had four 1,000-yard players. None of them would you would consider stars in the NFL. Curtis Samuel was one of them, who's now here in Buffalo. One of the things that, again, we talked about before we started taping that I thought was such a good point was when a team in Stefan Diggs' case learns that it can win without you, that's red, that should be a red flag for a player. It's not that the Bills won without Stefan Diggs, but they won without him being the first six or seven games of the season, Stefan Diggs, the 1,700 yard wide receiver, Stefan Diggs. He was a good player, but he wasn't a player that commands $27 million against the salary cap. So, I, again, like I said before, it's nuanced. Do I think that they want to spread the ball around more? Yeah, I do. I think they drafted Dalton Kincaid. They believe in Khalil Shakir. They think Curtis Samuel is going to have a role. We know James Cook can play. And if they get a receiver in the first or second round, they're going to want him to touch the ball. So I think when you look at all of those factors, combined with Dick's age, combined with his uh, moodiness, for lack of a better word, I think all of those things factor into why they decide to, to make this move when they did it. The Green Bay scenario would be ideal, right? You've got a bunch of first and second year receivers all over the field growing with your quarterback. I'm thinking of quarterbacks on Josh Allen's level, though, like Joe Burrow and Jamar Chase. And I mean, Patrick Mahomes, I mean, Kelsey is a dinosaur compared to what he once was, but he still went to Kelsey in some pretty big spots yeah, in yeah, the playoffs. Yeah. Like, yeah. There's a trust level there with a veteran. Um, but, well, but while you say that, where was the trust level with Diggs? Why didn't Diggs make the play down the field, right? Why is Marquez, last Mar why is Marquez Valdez Scantling making big catch after big catch in that game for Kansas City, and Stefan Diggs isn't? At some point, we've got to we've got to put some of this on Stefan Diggs. Mm -hmm. Stefan Diggs is a great, great player. He's going to go down in history as a top three receiver in my mind in Bills history. You've got Eric Moles and Andre Reid, uh, vice versa, as one two, right? They had the longevity. Diggs' numbers are such that, in talent-wise, he's up there. But you can't ignore the guy's numbers in the playoffs. He disappeared in the playoffs. Oh, yeah. He just did. And that ball in the fourth quarter is through his arms. And that ball on the other side is getting, catch getting caught by Marquez valdez Scantlin. And that's a problem. And that's that is a slump on Diggs, bro. One of the best throws we've seen out of Josh Allen in his career. He, and he's made a couple of – he made one to Gabe Davis against, oh, yeah. in the loss to the Jets that was 75 yards on a on a rope. And so it's like – The loss to the Bengals in the playoffs, right, to Gabe Davis? I think at the left sideline. I mean, there's – A lot – I mean, there's a lot of – there's a lot of examples of – Stefan Diggs kind of coming up small in those moments. Yeah, I did a little mini series on like the Bills and how they can kind of smash the window wide open to go for the Super Bowl a few days before the Stefan Diggs trade. But Bill Polian said with his Colts teams, you know, similar to the Bills, knocking on the door, falling short, only getting to a point. 
you know, as the GM of the team, him and him and then Tony Gunji, they, they look at the roster, or what players are helping us win in the playoffs? Who falls short in the playoffs? All right, Mike Vanderjack, the most accurate kicker in NFL history. See ya. We're bringing in an Adam Vinatieri. I mean, defensively, taking some chances on playmakers, drafting a, a wide receiver, Illinois, to play corner in the second round. Um, I, I think you have to, that, I don't know if that factored in. I don't know where it ranked on Brandon Bean and Sean McDermott's priority list, but the fact that Stephon Diggs comes up short in the playoffs, that that definitely helps you feel good about this decision. I think it at least factors into it, right? Factors in. Yeah. yeah. What do you like in the draft? Then? Is there a guy, a receiver? Yeah, that's that a great question. Well? Yeah, I you know, I think a lot of them it, it's it's fun. It's a fun year to cover the draft, right? Because when you have like such a like people are so fixated on wide receiver, right? Everybody's fixated on it. And so you're looking at all of these guys and like, you've got that top three and everybody thinks like, okay, they're, those guys are gone in the top 10. They probably are. And so then it becomes like, well, which one, what are you looking for? Are you looking for that four, two, one record breaking combine Xavier worthy speed? Are you looking for the Keon Coleman contested catches is Brian Thomas, how long is he going to last? Do you have to move up for him? A.D. Mitchell, like everything, like the numbers check out, the production checks out, but, you know, why, like there, there seems like maybe there's something missing there. So it's a really fascinating draft. I think we're going to learn a lot about not just Brandon Bean, but really like Joe Brady too, in terms of like what type of receiver do you feel like this offense needs? Because I'm, I feel really comfortable saying that, they can stay. They can stay at twenty eight and get a guy that's going to fill like what what it is that they're looking for. Maybe Worthy's gone, right? And Worthy's kind of like a flower, right? Where he's different. Like you, that type of speed is different. But if you want, like, if you want the contested catch, if you want the the four three forty vertical threat, they're all there. And it, so it's kind of fascinating to think about, like. And I, I, again, I think we go back to that. Do you need a true number one receiver to win? And the thing for me, too, is that, like, I know we've seen rookie receivers come in and succeed, but how much are we putting on a rookie receiver? And uh, in terms of being like a, if, if we consider the Bills Super Bowl contenders, it's a lot to ask of any rookie receiver, even if it's a number one, like a first round pick. Like, are you really expecting them to come in and command 100 plus targets? Diggs was up at 150 around there. Like, let's say that you drop that down to 130. Are you giving a rookie 130 targets in this offense? Lots to learn. I think it comes back to Joe Brady, too. Jeremy yeah. made this point. Like, there is going to be a lot of pressure on Joe Brady. What is his offense? What does it look like? Yeah. Um, the defense actually played better toward the end of last season. We don't really know what a Joe Brady offense in full is because we know Brian Dable and then Ken Dorsey adopting Brian Dable's offense with such weeks. It was complicated. Like, I'm sure you talk to these players too. Like, they come through this thing and they're like, wow, that is the most complex offense I had to learn in terms of terminology. Well, think, about, think about where it came from, right? New England. New England, yep. right? And how long had Tom Brady been there, right? And so how well did he know that offense, right? And so that follows Dave all, right? And now you're looking at it and it's like, all right, well, Josh has been here seven years. He knows it inside now. But for to your point, a young player comes in, how much is he able to pick? Like Khalil Shakir didn't really do a lot as a rookie, 10 catches, right? Now he took a huge step forward. Really one of the guys that really surprised me, but I think that's why you have to be a little bit cautious in terms of like projecting any rookie. Unless it's simplified. Do you think he could simplify this offense into something else? Well, it, it, he's, it, it, yeah, yes, I do. And it's such a good point about Brady because when did he take over? Game 11 last year. How much is he changing? Yeah, he's not going to change that much. Right? It's very, very little, right? And so now he's got this entire offense, or excuse me, entire off season to reinvent or even if you don't, even if that's too strong of a word to leave his mark or put his stamp on this offense. And yeah, it could look a lot. I mean, listen, their game plans changed, right? Their game plans changed dramatically. Everyone points to that Dallas game, you know, and I, I love that. I love that he stuck what was with what was working. We're running the ball. Why change it? Right. And so 
I can appreciate that. And I'm really curious, interested to see what his offense looks like. And, you know, it kind of goes back to what we said. So what type of receiver does he feel like he needs for this offense? We're going to learn a lot about that Thursday or Friday. It was, it was, it reminded me of like the old Ellicottville football days where it's high school football, <laughs> that Dallas game. Like you, you're running the ball. You know they can't stop you. So you're just going to keep running the ball. I mean, it really was pathetic if you're the Dallas Cowboys, right? I mean, what, what a sad existence. Well, listen, you've seen the Bills on the other side of those games. Bill Belichick has done that multiple times to the Bills, right? But my point would be, like, that's great, but I think the NFL is different in 2024. Like, if you were, like, if, like put your brain in the place of, okay, you're getting four yards, six yards, eight yards, four yards at will, but it's through the air. Think of it as you're thinking and dunking passing. It would be kind of kind of sad to watch right it'd be kind of like a water gun fight yeah yeah like you still need explosives like you need yeah you need to get big yardage and big chunks and yep. and you, know, you don't want to be nickel and diamond 10 11 12 13 plays every drive that that's why i love worthy but, i mean worthy is that player yeah that could bust this thing open for you yeah but i mean don't you think that that's the way that defenses are going though is that they're, yes. ma- they're making you they're making you that do that you so you need right. a player that can just put a yeah no matter what you know put a needle in that blow it. you know it's funny like where's the around runs this 4 2 one at the combine and everybody everybody's excited and i get it but i'm looking at him and i'm thinking he's smaller than roscoe parish but as we've gotten closer to the draft i'm kind of coming around to the idea because like what you said like that speed is just game changing and they don't can't touch these receivers, right? Yeah. And they haven't had, they have not had that. Diggs wasn't that guy. Gabe Davis isn't that guy. You know, go down the list. They, they, they just don't have that. They, they haven't. And it's kind of fun to think. It's kind of fun to think about how do you use them? Now, the, 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 the other part of that, that I, I maybe hesitate or, or just kind of like step back a little bit is like, well, how is that different than they plan on using Curtis Samuel? Because I think Curtis Samuel, I anticipate them using him in a way that's not the traditional wide receiver, X receiver, or flanker, or whatever. I think that you know he's going to get carries. He's going to do things like that. But listen, that's why Joe Brady makes millions of dollars. Figure it out, right? So give him a weapon. Give him something that a team has to worry about. Any team that drafts a taker worthy the opposing defensive coordinator is going to have to worry about. So it's an intriguing idea. I mean, don't you think if he gets by 28, that Kansas City's taking him at 32? Right? Exactly. Isn't Andy Reid looking at it and going, give me Xavier Worthy? That might yeah. that, that might be reason alone to draft. I mean, game. the Chiefs, they they leaped over Buffalo and they tried McDowell. Yeah. And the Bills were left with Kyrie Yeah. So, yeah. You're going to want to be aggressive, I think. Yeah. Gosh, can, can you imagine can, can really sit, really? Yeah. Can you really sit there? I hope he falls to you. You're what I mean. If that's who you want, if he, right, if 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 that's if Joe Brady looks at that and says, "Boy, I can make that guy work in my offense." Well, we know Bean is traded up. He's done it almost every year in the first yeah. round, so he's willing to do it, and that'd be fun. That that it, it will be fun to watch Xavier Worthy wherever he lands. It, it's going to take. I think it's going to take a creative offensive mind though to make a guy that's 169 pounds worth yes. in your office. So just trade two or three first round picks to go get <laughs> Marvin Harrison or Malik Neighbors or Roma Dunes. Yeah, right? Right, yeah. Well, so my most recent mock draft for the Buffalo News, I had them moving up to number nine with the Bears. The Bears are interesting. They have four picks in the strip. That's crazy. Now, three of them are in the top 75, including, including two of the first nine. So they've got like premium picks, but not a lot of draft capital. They're a rebuilding team. The numbers like work out really well. So the Bills, when the Chiefs came up from Mahomes, the Bills went from 10 down to 27. We're talking about 9 to 28 mm-hmm. right now. So almost an apples to apples comparison. The Chiefs gave up their number one, obviously, the number one the next year, and a third. The Bills don't have a third this year. I proposed the one, so 28, a four, a six, and the first next year. Now, it might cost a little bit more, maybe maybe another pick next year. But, you know, the numbers, the, the Johnson chart, whatever, they all are pretty close. And it, it makes you wonder, you know, like, and, and this is another point that I raised. Like, so you, you own this 2025 second now for Minnesota. 
you're betting Minnesota stinks, right? With their quarterback situation. That's you're looking at, right, let's say that pick is 38, maybe 40. You're the Bills and you're saying we we're, we want to be picking we want to be picking 32, but maybe we're picking somewhere between 26 and 32. So you're looking at moving down 12 spots, right? I so I I think the first rounder next year is on the table for for a move up. And so do, we know Bean's aggressive. Do they go get a Dune say? Do they, does everything that they've said publicly, meaning on Thursday when they talked about, well, you know, we think you can spread it out and you, maybe you don't need a number one receiver to win. Is that all nonsense? Right, they're not going to set a different word there, but you know, yeah, 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 yeah. Like, is that just draft smoke? And can you get into the top 10 for, I mean, a Dune say is an awesome prospect. So, you know, they love them off the field, too. Yeah. It, the, the team's in land. You, 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 yeah, you, you think that uh, they're at, yeah, they're 30. a pick before. 30, yep. So, I mean, you would assume Raheem Morris is going to want Edge rush. somebody on defense. Edge rush. He might have yeah. Dallas Turner, whoever. Sure. His pick of anybody on defense yeah. at that pick. I don't know. I, they're gonna get a they're gonna get a defensive guy. They're they're talking about this draft is potentially having the most offensive players in round one in league history. Oh yeah. So if, I, I think if you're in Atlanta and you want defense, you can go to twenty eight and say we're gonna get an impact defender there. I'm just saying though, like Atlanta, that pick, I, that's what Buffalo doesn't know. Like if yeah. they're gonna do the right thing and draft, I do and say, I mean, yeah. this is a league that doesn't care about defense. Yeah, hip drop tackle, all that nonsense. Like, yeah. just I'll just try to go out there and throw the ball all, all over the place. I don't know if they'll get to that place. I think they should. But if they they can take him right there, then your plans are thwarted. But for all we know, Brandon Bean and Ryan Poles have a trade all set, right? Could, could that, that was the case with the home deal you referenced. Like, they had that deal set with John Dorsey and the Chiefs. Yeah. Like, if the player that they want, whether it's Watson or Mahomes, is still on the board, they're going to do the trade. Yeah. Maybe that's a doomsday for the Bills. Maybe they wait to that pick. Yeah. And if he's still on the board, they've got the trade ready to go, and they go. Yeah. But the Falcons are kind of a wild card. Yeah. But what are they going to do? We still don't really know. Maybe, yeah. maybe that's what the Bills are sitting on. Yeah. Yeah it, yeah. it certainly could be. And I mean, listen, the, Bear, the Bears might love a doomsday. And right. they, he'd be a lot of fun, right? DJ Moore, uh, Keenan Allen, a doomsday. Caleb Williams, like, wow, that's a great top Cole, three to Matt, be thrown. DeAndre Swift, yeah. Yeah, right, right, exactly. So, yeah, I mean, it, that's what makes the draft so fun. You know, we're like, a lot of us were here earlier talking about, like, I, I really enjoy covering the draft. Yeah. I can't pretend to know all these projects. One thing I've learned, like, covering the draft is that, like, your immediate reaction to any pick should be, okay, and that's it. Because it's like, <laughs> nobody knows? knows. Nobody knows about any of these guys. We talked about the Allen Rosen thing and yeah. how most Bills fans wanted Rosen. And you just never know with these guys. And, like, it's their livelihood. You, Jim, Jim, Jim could talk to this better than anyone, right? Yeah. It's their livelihood. It's what they do for a living. Um, but it is fun because you you know you you study them you think about how you know how they would fit who you want you you develop like these like oh yeah that guy he's really good and he makes a lot of sense and I think everyone's guilty of it guilty isn't the right word but it's like everybody does it and it's it's what makes the draft like such a fun event to cover you know and it, it goes even beyond like the first round like you get down to the third or fourth round it's like wow that guy's still there what's going on you know yeah. and so it, it it's it's a fascinating draft i feel like when you're a team like the bills and you're close every draft is so critical right and we, you know i think a lot of what we've said about this year's draft and how crucial it is for brandon mean we you know we've said it in the past we said it last year like and you know they i i think he did a darn good job in the draft last year you know and but he's had, and I've been very very critical of Brandon Bean's day two picks in particular, second round, third round. He's struggled mightily. Torrance last year maybe changes that a little bit, right? Um, you know, Kincaid in the first round, you give Allen a weapon, and so it's it's sort of fascinating to sort of see like how how they view this. What you know, like what is the option if it isn't receiver? Because so much attention has been spent on receiver. Could they take another position? Like, Bean's going to come out from behind that, you know, little door or wall at one Bills drive and know, like, uh, all right, I'm, I'm going to face the music here. If he takes somebody that isn't a receiver in the first round, how does he justify that? You know, like, 
a lot of questions and and that's i think that makes it a, like part of the fun we'll be there it'll hey, be bro. fun you know i know uh jay this was great thanks so much buddy, buddy. Awesome, great man. to see a yeah. great insight the buffalo news jay skirsky make sure you follow him what is your handle on just my name x machine jay skirsky, jay skirsky. Jay skirsky. But simple more importantly go to buffalo news and subscribe Please, want to read please, and, because that's and where you get the substance. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, help us out here a little bit, right? Thanks, everyone. Thank you.